Welcome to Off Script with Dan Dwyer on Robin Hood Radio, featuring in-depth interviews with guests from the world of theater and allied arts, underwriting support from Johnny Cake Books in Salisbury, Connecticut, whose collection of rare collectible and out-of-print books is housed in a 19th century cottage in one of the most old-fashioned small towns in New England. And now, here's the host of Off Script, Dan Dwyer. Well, thanks, Marshall. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back to Offscript actor Stefan Welfort. He was a guest a few summers ago on the heels of his successful run at Lennox's Shakespeare and Company of his show called Cry Havoc, a one-man play autobiographically inspired that combines Shakespeare with the experience of warfare and the challenges of veterans returning to civilian life. Stefan's toured the country with the play. He's opened it up to veterans everywhere and has now formed a nonprofit organization called Decruit, as opposed to Recruit. And Stephen's here today to talk about Decruit and its unique theater-based approach to addressing the mental health issues of veterans. Thanks for coming back. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and congratulations on forming um, Decruit. Um, for those who didn't see Cry Havoc at um, Shakespeare and Company a couple of years ago or haven't seen it in New York or other cities, could you tell us briefly what it is and how you came about it. And I know that that's a whole program in itself, which we've already done, but as a basis for talking about Decruit. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, it is, it is yeah, a whole could... other program. <laughs> um, but uh, Give us your life story in 25 seconds, exactly. please. The, the, the elevator pitch, right? Yeah, right. Um, the gist of it is uh, that it's, it is my story of, of having a breaking moment in the military when a friend of mine was killed seeing a Shakespeare play, which I, I grew up in Wisconsin, didn't wasn't exposed to theater, much less Shakespeare, saw Shakespeare's Richard III, who as a veteran, right on stage, uh, expressing how I felt back to me, and it changed my life. I left the army, went to graduate school for theater, and this play not only culminates that journey, but, but um, interweaves Shakespeare the way I see it, and my journey through post-traumatic stress, even recognizing that I had it and why, why I would have it, and... Um, operates on the premise that we're wired for war in the military, but not unwired from war. And I use Shakespeare now. The D-Crew program is quite literally to unwire from war using the same principles, essentially, that the military used to wire us for war. And so the show itself is a, is, is a little uh, hour and 15 minute microcosm of that entire experience, showing Shakespeare's relevance today and showing these, um, how ancient the suffering of our veterans is, and but how contemporary Shakespeare's words are to the veteran experience. And for those of us who are not uh, steeped in Shakespeare, Cry Havoc comes from and refers to? It refers to a specific ancient order. Um, cry Havoc means throw out the rules of war. It's, it Cry means yell. That's the confusing part. It means yell the order Havoc uh, and throw out all of the rules of war. Um, and that specific phrase that I lifted from is from Mark Anthony's speech in Julius Caesar. Although Shakespeare uses that phrase, havoc, and um, uses the specific phrase in multiple plays, in Henry V, among others, um, and refers to it in, in many of the others, including Coriolanus. Right. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you developed the play in association with Bedlam Company. Is that right? I did. I did. did. I did. Well, uh, I developed it before I was developing it before. I, I don't know. If, I think Bedlam may have been formed already in New York. Eric, Eric Tucker, the director, and I went to graduate school together at Trinity Rep. And he was in New York at the time when I was developing Cry Havoc. I mean, going back to the form, formation of the play, it was, it was quite literally another really uh, down point in my life where I was breaking again, both physically and psychologically. And the play I, I decided to answer the question, what the heck is wrong with me? Um, and the play was the culmination of me trying to answer that question, what is wrong with me? You know, quote unquote, which is what happened to me. Um, so then when Eric was in LA on another uh, project, um, I paid him to direct it because he's a brilliant director. And, and then he's also a veteran too, I think. He's he is. Yes, he's yeah. a veteran of the Navy, yes. Yep. And, and we knew each other's aesthetic really well and we both understood the veteran experience. So yeah, when I moved to New York to work with Bedlam, then he um, ended up producing it off-Broadway for me. Now, it? at Bedlam, you combined um, the performances of, uh, uh, of Cry Havoc also with a mini program uh, for veterans in the New York City area. Talk about, mm. That was sort of a prelude, I guess, to Decrude in a way. So can you tell us a little bit about that, too? 
Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, Decrude is a specific program interweaving psychology. The Monday night classes. Um, it, yes and no. It, it, like everything, it's nuance, right? Eric really wanted his outreach uh, for Bedlam to be veteran specific, which of course I, I loved, and so we started Monday night classes, and they were fifty-two Mondays of the year. Um, it was three hours. And the premise that I operated it from was was come and go as you please. It's not one of those if you miss a week, you you know, it, there, you, you should be filled with shame and you must apologize. You know, it wasn't any of that. It was show. There's so many demands on veterans. We wanted this really to be a reprieve from stress, not a stress inducer. So um, they showed up and we worked on Shakespeare. Um, when when I was running it, it was Shakespeare uh, the entire time as it relates to personal experiences and personal um, struggles, uh, symptoms and feelings, what have you. So. Um, yeah, so we developed that every Monday night, and then now they've shifted it more towards where it's professional actor training, and I've I've separated from that and I'm working specifically with NYU with uh, and, and um, Alicia Ali over at NYU and Bessel van der Kolk, um, the International Trauma Institute, to try and really develop this into an actual treatment program for PTS. If in case you're just joining us, the program is off script. I'm your host, Dan Dwyer. My guest today is Stefan Walfert, um, who's the actor and director and rather um, writer of a one-man play called Cry Havoc about the experiences of warfare and how that relates to um, veterans getting back into civilian life and now the founder of an organization called Decruit. So, Stefan, tell us what was the moment when you said, um, I can do the play, I can invite veterans in to watch it, I can do group sessions around that, but you needed to do something more, let's say, institutional. Uh, like most things, it was a series of moments. So, um, Realizing that that I, I did this work, uh, a version of this work, even you know, even when I started graduate school in '97, I was seeing vet, uh, Shakespeare from a different perspective than my classmates. I talk about it in the show how, in my class, I was the only veteran. So when we discussed Henry V, I, I, you know, the Crispin Crispiana speech, the you know, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. I viewed that, viewed and felt that speech differently than my classmates. Of course. Um, so it really began that that journey of creating Decrude. And watching the classical actor training helped me regain control of some, uh, maybe, or, uh, all right, I'll leave it that way, regain control of some of the some of the habits and behaviors that I wanted more of in my body and in and, and silence or at least uh, reduce the volume on some of the habits and behaviors that I didn't want as much in my body, the classical actor training was helping with that. So when I moved to Los Angeles in 2003, um, I was mentoring under a Native American theater company, uh, Randy Reinholz, who created Native Voices. And I watched them use, uh, he as well as Yvette Nolan up at Native Earth in Canada, I watched them use openly theater as medicine. They didn't run from that phrase of theater being medicine. Um, it's part of their tradition. So I, they really helped me embrace that. And so Decrute started in Los Angeles. It just didn't have that name yet. I was doing programming for veterans um, using Shakespeare and narrative therapy already there. Um, moving to New York helped me find people who would study it and prove that what, what I already, what we all know, that, that, that the arts actually help healing. So would you describe Decrude as theater therapy or specifically Shakespeare therapy for veterans? I would describe it, if I had to choose, I would describe it as Shakespeare therapy because um, not only is the Shakespeare text spe very specific, but what's required in the body and breath. I mean, I heard the program bef before this where she was talking about keep breathing and the use of breath. That's how the military trains us and Shakespeare requires it. So the classical actor training that we use that, that is really mindfulness practices is applied towards Shakespeare. So I would say it's a Shakespeare program. Let's key on the word that you just used, training, uh, because yes. you say that the military trains people for warfare. Mm -hmm. And what you say is that veterans need to be retrained for, well, real life, for civilian life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you go about that? Um, I or go how, about how it. We, or how, how, how don't we as a society not go about it? <laughs> well, so. well uh, there's there's a longer chain of events there, uh, and this is another whole other program. But um, I'll stick with just the decrew part of what, <clears throat> excuse me, um, using the way the military uses breath, and then therefore the way we use breath. <clears throat> the military, if you think about 
whether it's calling cadence, where we march in a rhythm, right? And we all breathe in at the same time and we speak, you know, or sing at the same time. Um, this is Shakespeare. He wrote in a rhythm where we breathe in, our heartbeat is at the same time, and our breath and speaking is at the same the time. The iambic, yeah. Yes, right. in the iambic contaminator, which is our heartbeat. Ba-bum, That's right. Ba-bum, ba-bum. That's right. Yep. And he already wrote in the natural human rhythm of about five heartbeats per breath. Um, so to be or not to be, that is the question. <gasps> Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So he already did this in all of the, in, in his in his in his writing. Um, in the military, he does this in cadence. Another way to look at it is all branches, whether it's the army, navy, air force, marines, or coast guard, and regardless of your job, whether it's infantry, where you're you're fighting, you know, actually sh- seeing the people you're shooting and being shot at, um, or you're a water purification specialist. Everybody fires the rifle. They learn to fire the rifle at human silhouettes. And part of the way they overcome the psychology, they meaning the military, and I'm not demonizing, let me be very clear. That, no, this is repertorial. I mean, this yeah, is not, this it, is not yes. editorial. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, you know, it's a difficult job. I mean, the fact is that most humans will not kill another human being. So how do we override that? Left or right devices, it, we, we'd like to think we won't, right. 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 I mean, and, and statistically, we, we know this. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman's book covers this, among other things. But um, but to stick to the fact that, that the way they, they counter it is we breathe in. They teach us in the manual, um, all branches, they teach us to breathe in as you're holding the rifle, acquire the target, exhale, and on the exhale, stay empty and squeeze the trigger in between the heartbeats. Then breathe in and acquire the next target and repeat this process. And they train this over and over and over again, like I said, regardless of your job. So if it's that specific for that primal or that base, that horrific, if I can even that editorialize it, um, of, an, of an event, think of how deeply involved that tra- that is in the body. Right. So we're using that to unleash it. Shakespeare's lo- um, language has us breathe in, speak and express heightened language that requires a lot of the, not only the, the brain, but the body. The other thing is, um, that we discovered was that if you look at Bessel van der Kolk's work, specifically in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, he has pictures of brains of people who've been through severe trauma. And what we see in that is when we're, the trauma is reactivated, whether it's a memory or a smell that causes the memory or a sound, something that reactivates that memory, the higher brain shuts down. It literally goes offline and we go into our fight or flight system, our limbic system. But Shakespeare's language requires that we turn those higher parts back on. By speaking this heightened language, we have to turn on uh, Broca's area, the spe- this language center where we're making speech. I would argue that we're turning on Wernicke's area to understand this heightened language and so on. Our sense of self by the mere act of grounding in, breathing, and looking at the audience as Shakespeare's characters did, right? When they speak, when they ask a, a, or are speaking a soliloquy, they're talking directly to an audience saying, help me with this. So we engage that. We have the 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 actors or the veterans in this case look directly at the audience with their eyes, similar to what's known as EMDR, moving the eyes in a new way. So breaking their old habit of whatever they do physically to go back into the old trauma and instead make eye contact, ground, breathe in, speak this heightened language in the natural human rhythm so it's not inorganic to the body, it's organic, it's natural. And it, they can find themselves regulating them, their body, regulating their heart and rate and their brain as they go through this trauma. They teach themselves, oh, gosh, I actually can experience this and survive. I don't have to go to fight or flight. I don't have to go to life or death. It feels like it, but I, the theater, the Shakespeare text shows me I can actually go all the way through this and at the end of the speech still be alive and see the audience receiving me, even though I may have spoken really really awful things of what I've done. That's fascinating. Um, So in effect, and I don't want to dumb this down too much, if you're taking a veteran in one of your classes, you're really retraining them to look at another person as something other than a silhouette. Yeah, I I actually hadn't thought of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Um, so So that raises a question. If a veteran comes in and they have all different and we could talk about this too, all different kinds of mental health issues and Mm -hmm. with different severities. Um, To go through the process that you've just described that requires a veteran to revisit breath Mm -hmm. by breath the military training they had, has that in your experience been traumatic for participants in itself? Um, It can. So we... 
there's a broader question there of, of who's coming into the room. So that's right. That's the other way to that, ask the question. Yeah, please. Yes. For, for for our purposes, it, it bears stating that people are selecting us. So I'm not going into treat. Um, I mean, we do actually. Now that I say that, I do go. I do go into treatment programs, addiction centers, and polytrauma units. I do. But keep in mind, these are people who are volunteering to participate in this. So right. something in them um, is attractive, uh, whether it's the, the idea that it's theater or that it's Shakespeare or acting or something has brought them to me, that brought us together. So they're, knowing that, I think, is important because then they're self-regulating in a manner of speaking already. Um, right. And as I, as I give them prompts, they go as far as they are able um, the other thing is that that the Shakespeare text can can take you down a path. Um, um, what we tend to call it in, in 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 the field, if I can put it that way, is re-traumatize, right, or reactivate right. the trauma. Um, and in exposure therapy, for example, can do this for a lot for a, a fair number of people. But what happens is because of the Shakespeare monologues that I've selected, and I have about uh, twenty eight of them. To where they're specific to symptoms related to post-traumatic stress and and others. Um, when they begin this speech, it might bring up something. They may begin to shut down, but because of the group, the camaraderie, the medicine circle, um, as as Yvette Nolan has uh, shown me, the circle that we have, the group is there saying, breathe in and speak, breathe in. It's not one person coaching, it's everyone saying, breathe in and go, breathe in and go. What that does is it forces the person's body and brain to breathe in and move to the next line of Shakespeare's text, and then the next, and the next. And what that does is actually prevents, through camaraderie and form, form of the speech, prevents them from say, staying in a stuck point or recycling into their trauma. It in fact instead takes them through it, journeys through, and comes out the other side. Fascinating. Um, just to break a little bit, were you familiar with an organization in New York called Creative Alternatives? No. No, okay. Creative Alternatives, I only mention it because my husband was on the board for many years, and Creative Alternatives was the first um, nonprofit organization to really institutionalize using theater therapy to treat people with mental health issues. That's, that's and fantastic. And because it so successfully integrated um, its technique into mental health practices across a variety of venues and spectrums, it folded as a nonprofit. It had met its mission. Um, but what you're doing is much more specific and much more acutely um, – um, applicable than 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 that. Um, given the, your exposure to all different kinds of of veterans, and I suspect there are women in your group as well as men, although we would think primarily of men veterans, right? Well, the stereotype tends to do that. Ten, the number one question I work with women veterans groups, um, both co-ed, if I can put it that way, sure, you know, group yeah. mixed. But also with women veterans only uh, uh, groups. And the, when I ask six questions from Chris Johnson's question bridge, I've modified them with his permission. Um, what is the question that you are asked most as a woman veteran? And the number one question, without doubt, throughout the 32 states I've worked is, really? You're a veteran, but you're a woman. <laughs> yeah. I, w I don't mean to make light of this, but um, I would have guessed the first question they would have, would, would have been asked is, um, how were you subject of abuse? Yeah. Well, that comes next, doesn't okay, it? Right. Yeah. For men, it's, did you ever kill anyone? And right. for women, it's, it's, uh, it's usually, oh, really? You're a veteran. And then were you raped? Right. Cause I've been hearing about the rapes. So right. yeah, it's, it's, it, they're not the, the best l open liners. <laughs> so whether we're talking about men or women veterans, what do you, what is the, what is the problem that binds most of them who have a mental health issue? Well, what do they have in common? I mean, they're all different kinds of mental health issues. You, you know, I am going to say something that can be fairly controversial. What I tend to see, so what, the reason I mentioned earlier the, my prologue to this, to my answer, is that when I said I, I go into these groups and we're finding each other, I, I say that because there is no requirement for anyone to be diagnosed with anything to work with me. We're working with people, who, some who have been diagnosed, but Many are coming in and they're, they're part of that 70% that of the veterans who just kind of fit back in and don't self-disclose as veterans. They've, they've just kind of secretly went back about into the community from any age, from uh, not even out an entire year from the military or out uh, since Vietnam 
or even the Korean War era, which we've, which we've worked with, as well as World wow. War II. So with that in mind, um, the, the theme that I tend to see, um, and this is what I suspected because this was true for me, is that um, the, I really wanted the military to be responsible for everything that's quote unquote wrong with me. But the reality is, is I went into the military with a lot of issues, putting quotes around that word. Um, I arguably had PTS going in. And what I'm finding is that thematically is childhood trauma. These are adult survivors of childhood trauma. And the military is attractive quite specifically to adult survivors of childhood trauma. I'm not saying that everyone I work with has this. Um, and it's varying degrees. If you're familiar with the ACE score, adverse childhood experiences, um, that's what I'm talking about is people who at least score um, above Tip, what's typical on, on that ACE score? So my immediate, my immediate reaction to that, and I don't find it particularly controversial, is is it because people who've experienced childhood abuse seek out environments that offer the security of, of authority? Uh, that's certainly one of them, yes. Yeah. Well, authority, I think, I think look at any commercial for the military and you pick one of those things. Those are not by accident, right? The military, whether it's the Marines, the few, the proud, the Marines, or the the army, which back in my day was be all you can be. Oh, what sure. a great yeah. notion yeah. for someone who didn't fit into his community, didn't feel like he fit in at home. What what a great idea to go, really? I can be all I can be. And then now it's be an army of one, right? So I've got camaraderie as well. And Navy, a force for good, right? So I can serve something higher than myself. I can be something than other than what um, I mean, it really is Hamlet. When Hamlet asks to be or not to be, that is the question. It's not just should I kill myself or not. It's should I be everything that I can, I think I can be, that I know I can be, or should I just be what everyone thinks I am? Um, so that's the military has entire commercials on that saying, yeah, come join us. We'll break you down from whatever you are currently and build you up into an army, a, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or Coast Guard member. And, and and that's attractive. So, of course, that's attractive to people who've gone through um, less than typical or less than desirable childhoods. Right. In case you're just joining us, the program's off script. I'm your host, Dan Dwyer. My guest is Stephen Walford, and we're having a fascinating conversation, not just about his play Cry Havoc, which is uh, about his autobiographical experience in the military, combining it with Shakespeare's take on warfare, but how he's established an organization called Decruit that's incorporated Shakespeare techniques in dealing with veterans facing mental health issues. Um, in your experience, what's the difference then between a veteran who goes on and has, and I'm going to say this in quotes, a normal life and a perfectly successful life, let's say somebody like Seth Moulton, the congressman from, from Massachusetts, and people who serve but can't quite get it together again? Mm. Uh, two, two major factors, and the, and the research has been supporting this as well. The two major factors, I would say, is the community that you come out of the military into. Um, and that can often be um, interwoven with the community that you had before the military, the community you had in the military, and the community you come out to after the military. If you have supportive, uh, structured community before, during, and after, the likelihood of you having issues, whether PTS or others, um, are significantly diminished. Of course, right? Because you have that support and you have people going, uh, resources available to you. Right. If you don't, obviously, the, the statistics that we see go, are much, much higher depending on what kind of, what the community is. That, I don't want to say what kind, but what level of support you have from a community when you come out. The suicide rates are higher amongst veterans. The addiction rates, the homelessness rates, the incarceration rates. We also get harsher, longer prison sentences. So, and on and on and on. And if we have a community to the, uh, and resources available, ready for us and waiting when we come out, rather than having to go sign up for them, these numbers go down significantly. Right. Um, this also can be affected by the experience in the military and before the military. So as if we have, if, for example, we're one of the, it's not just women, by the way. I know the statistic is one in three female service members has been raped in the military. Um, but the actual numbers of men raped in the military that the numbers, not pr not not the proportion, but the numbers are higher. Men are raped at extremely high numbers as well. So this this violence that that's being inflicted on these men and women when they're in from their own comrades, what happens right to the 
what happens then to the to the to our as Jonathan Shea calls it, it's a moral injury. What happens to our brain structure right. when people we trusted um, not just betrayed us, but in this violent, violent way? And then we leave the military. How do you share that? We barely talk about our military experience when we get out. Does so, Shakespeare make any reference to that kind of abuse? Uh, to this, to the sexual violence or yeah, the violence? Sexual in? violence. Oh, where's Tina Packer when I need her? <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt that he does. does in uh, some kind of some kind of artful form. I'm su- I'm sure. Um, we've only got time for a couple more questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are the living example of what theater, how theater can transform a life. You're an example of how Shakespeare can be specifically applied for those that need to. Um, decruit who need to incorporate themselves into a non-warfare civilian life. Do you see the change in the men or the women that come to your program? Yes. How yes. so? Um, we have the um, Bessel van der Kolk calls it a shift, right? So there's an actual shift, not just change, change in the brain, which we've taken pictures, EEGs, electroencephalograms of the brains of the men and women before they take the program. And then after, and it's a different brain. It's it's actually firing in a more regulated manner. We've we've turned these hot spots, if I can put it like that, these spots that are overactive, like the amygdala and the hippocampus. We've turned them down a bit, where they're regulating in a more optimal level. Um, that's my word, not the scientist's word. Um, so we've not only have taken heart rate variability, uh, you know, bioscans that are heart rate variability and electroencephalograms and self disclosure surveys, but we can see the shift. Um, medications don't cause that kind of shift. They treat symptoms, but they don't, I'm not, again, not demonizing, just stating the facts that we see about a 30 to 37% increase with Prozac and other medications, but it's not a long-term overall improvement of health. Right. Ours does. Right. We, in fact, the fact is, is that when, when, when veterans work on decrute and continue the practice, they can actually get off their medications, including dietary changes that help them get off certain stimulants or things that cause um, their get in the, their body's way of healing, um, if I can put it that way. So the 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 shift is the sense of self, the sense of who I am. Again, that Hamlet question of who who I who I am and who I could be. So we do see a shift. They they take on these big speeches, right, that, that actually terrorize actors. <laughs> like, oh my any, God, I've Any actor, this. right. <laughs> right. And they're like, who the, I don't know who the hell this guy is. Sure, yeah, I'll get up and do it. And they get up and um, do these incredible speeches and go, yep, that's exactly how I feel. And then we ask them to do it again. You can see it affecting them physically. Ask them to do it again. And they, we see a shift as they do this over and over in a mere 24 hours over, over eight weeks, meeting once a week for three hours a week. We see a dramatic shift in their being. They feel and experience that dramatic shift and share it. So yes, absolutely, it does. It changes them. It's fascinating, and I want to congratulate you not only on the play "Cry Havoc," which I saw a couple of years ago, um, which I just think is fabulous um, and really, really moving, but also on this really important work that you're doing for a veteran who might be listening or anyone else who's interested in decrew. Where do they go? Um, go to uh, www.decruit.org, just like recruit, D-E-C-R-U-I-T.org. We have classes in New York every Monday night, classes in Fort Worth every Monday night, and soon in Fairbanks and San Francisco as well. Stefan, thank you very much, and uh, not only for coming on Offscript, but for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Oh, you're welcome. You so <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Uh, the program's been off script. It's unwritten by Johnny Cake Books in Salisbury, Connecticut. I've been your host. I still remain your host, Dan Dwyer. And until the next time uh, you listen in, be well. Underwriting support for Off Script with Dan Dwyer from Johnny Cake Books in Salisbury, Connecticut, whose collection of rare, collectible, and out of print books is housed in a 19th century cottage in one of the most old fashioned small towns in New England. Off Script with Dan Dwyer is also available via podcast on our on demand page, RobinHoodRadio.com. Click on On Demand and then click on Off Script with Dan Dwyer. <laughs>